Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to the Elitist Geek VR News for Wednesday, November 9th, 2016. Let's jump right into VR, guys. A little bit of preamble. And I want to start by talking about the Quick Look series. Uh, I get asked this from time to time, or I'll read comments that don't really represent what the Quick Look series is trying to achieve. Not like a negative thing or anything like that, just, you know, probably requires some clarification. And that's basically what this is. So let's start with what the Quick Look series is not. And what it isn't is a gameplay playthrough, right? Tips, strategies, the game from start to finish. It's not that, which is probably pretty obvious. But if you're new to the channel, that's kind of why I'm going over it. Uh, it's also not a review. Reviews, you know, require investment of time to be you know, fairly quality. You want to be able to give a game its due diligence and, and spend your time actually playing it. Part of the issue with me for what I'm trying to achieve, and we'll get that, uh, get into that when I talk about what the Quick Look series is as opposed to what it isn't. But yeah, so not a review. It's also not purposely negative or positive. And Nothing wrong with that format. You'll see Cinema Massacre, for example, the uh, angry uh, Nintendo gamer nerd, right? Love those videos. Um, purposely negative. That That's kind of what I mean by that. Um, love those videos, but again, not what I'm trying to achieve. So what is the Quick Look series trying to achieve? I want it to be, think of it as it's our gaming night tonight on Wednesday, uh, you and me are grabbing some snacks, some bevies, head to the man cave, crack a couple cold ones, and check out a game, you know, that we just bought for the first time. The idea being for, for you guys watching it, it should, at the end of that video, you should have enough information, if I've done my job, to determine if it's something you want to spend more time looking into or if it's something that you can kind of walk away from, right? So if I've done that, then I've kind of achieved what I set out to do, right? So yeah, to give you those bits of information, those nuggets, those first reactions that when you do a review, you could forget about because, you know, or you get numb to because you've spent hours with the game. So when it's truly the first time for me as well, I think those raw observations are, are better, right, as a result. Uh, it's also not purposely spoiler material. And unfortunately, there have been instances, La Perry, <laughs> uh, Gnomes and Goblins, where it couldn't be helped, right, because the full experience or game was as long as the damn video. Where that happens, I will always announce it up front, just like I did with those two videos, to warn you so... If you wanted to keep that, you know, as a personal experience or get into it, you're not going to get it ruined for you, right? So hopefully that explains what the intention is behind the Quick Look series. And speaking of that, the game I did in the Quick Look series episode last night was Robinson the Journey. So I've had some people ask me about my opinion for the game, right? Because I even mentioned in the kind of the narration at the start that it cost 80 freaking bucks Canadian, and hopefully at least it meets my expectations. Well, so far it has. It's a three to five hour game, and normally that, that you know, that's kind of near my threshold for three to five hours at $80. But hey, haven't reached that opinion yet. I'm So far it's all positive. I love the scope of the game so far. The gameplay uh, has been fun, intuitive. The controls haven't been sloppy doesn't mean I agree with all the controls. The motion controller absence, that had me scratching my head and been so busy, I still haven't been able to look into that, see if that's as intended, or I just screwed up, right? But you would think it would be the natural intuitive controller to use for the game, but I'm not sure. What else did I like about it? I liked the pacing. I didn't find the AI particularly awesome, but didn't really dislike them. And... Uh, Oh, God, what is that character's name in Baldur's Gate 1 for the PC? But just annoyed the crap out of me. But anyways, not one of those. So, yeah, as I play it more, I will definitely be able to form that opinion at some point, whether it is worth it or not. And at that point, 
I will let you guys know. Probably in one of these preambles at the start. But yeah, so far so good. Next up, Cowboys and Aliens, which uh, by it, and this is for the Vive platform, HTC Vive. Their own description is whimsical room scale Western VR shootout. And it's got some amazing um, multiplayer options. For example, uh, Deathmatch and Free For All style. Capture the flag, but instead of the flag, you're capturing gold bars or stealing gold bars from each other. You can even use the gold bar as a weapon, right? Like as a club and blunt force trauma. So very, very cool. But what I liked the most about what I've read and seen about the game is the fact that the scenery, the props are all destructible or mostly destructible. A table, hell, flip it on its side, use it as a shield, barrels, hide behind them move them into place, those types of things. A lot of freedom and a lot of destructible props, which for me is always win-win. So yeah, that's Cowboys and Aliens. I've put a YouTube link down in the description as well. So check that out. Uh, it's multiplayer. So if that's what you've been looking for and you are a Vive person, check that out. Next game, Space Stalker. So I don't want to sound too exasperated, but Gear VR has a lot of space games, and that's not a bad thing. It's normally a really good thing. Unfortunately, they're very, very same, same in terms of being pulpy arcade shooters. And if that's what you like, not a problem. You're going to have a lot of what you like on the Gear VR. Um, what I would love to see more of is a more meaty kind of experience. It doesn't obviously have to be full-blown Elite Dangerous style, but if it could kind of go in that direction. And there's a couple that, you know, you could see they, they wanted to go more in that direction, but, but scaled it back purposely. And that's unfortunate. But uh, yeah, Space Stalker looks good from what I can see. Just keep in mind, it is like uh, Anshar 2 and a lot of those games pretty much a arcade space shooter for VR. Again, not bad, just same, same. All right, news-wise, uh, let's start with NVIDIA and their VR works, which was something that they had uh, embedded. Custom builds of Unity were using it. Now they've got it available for full-on. So, uh, you're able to, like an early access. What I find interesting about it is not just the fact that it has those accelerator features, right? Especially if you've got a Pascal-based. If you've got a Pascal-based card, like my 1080 Founders Edition, uh, according to them and everything I've read and seen, I should be getting a lot of extra performance, additional eye candy, uh, you know, much smoother rendering than without. If you don't have a Pascal-based card, you're still going to get benefit from this. Just not quite as much, but you'll still get some benefit for VR acceleration. And some of the stuff, you know, to get specifically into where it would be advantageous for Pascal-based cards, multi-res shading is one of them. And that was always kind of in the custom branches of the engine. And it allows the game devs to deal with barrel distortion, right? For rendering corrected images to the HMD. It also provides rendering multiple viewports across a single render target using multi-projection. Uh, multi so here's an example. And uh, this is directly from the site. Pascal GPUs benefit the most because they can simultaneous multi, uh, use simultaneous multi-projection technology to perform lens-matched shading where 16 views can be rendered at different angles in a single pass. And single-pass stereo, which allows for reprojecting geometry around a second viewport, would allow 32 views to be rendered in a single pass. So... The potential is pretty good for this. Time will tell and actual hands-on experience if it's as beneficial as all that. I really hope it is because that's going to make that initial 
you know, reason to go over the 1080 that I talked about months ago. You know, if you're looking to upgrade, the consideration was, look, VR works if and when it becomes accepted and used, you're going to get that benefit over the 980. So hopefully this is the start of exactly that. Next news piece, a plastic surgeon excited by VR. And I've talked about VR and the potential, you know, in the healthcare and medicine in general. And this is a really good example, but it's from the surgeon's perspective. So I've included the link to that. Have a read uh, if it's of interest to you. But he talks about some fascinating stuff, like the innate biases that we have as humans formed literally from our toddlerhood and babyhood, right? Facial expressions, how important they are for conveying things between humans, right? And the people who don't have that ability, whether it's facial paralysis, right? Or someone who's been burned, right? And had, you know, portions of their face compromised as a result of that, you know, there's innate biases in our society and there are people who are going to stare and there's obviously self-confidence issue for some of those people. Others, you know, could deal with it a lot better. Um, whatever the reason, <laughs> the point the surgeon tries to make is that VR can offer an escape, but not just an escape, you know, or harmful in the way that recreational drugs could form an escape. It's escape in a constructive way. And for a device that, you know, many have called antisocial could actually allow people with those types of, you know, body image, comfort issues, medical, to socialize in a way where that is not a factor. So... Uh, very cool, very good article, and that just kind of scratches the surface. He gets into it a bit deeper and explains it a lot better than I can uh, with his surgeon speak, right? But very, very cool article. All right, and then the, uh, the last news story I wanted to talk about has to do with Split VR and the technology kind of behind Split VR. Now, what it isn't is an independent standalone system. In fact, as they were developing this, they initially used the Oculus Rift, the split VR guys, and ultimately the Sony PlayStation controller, or uh, uh, Sony PlayStation VR HMD rather, because of the, the techniques that they use in their software to capture the tracking information. The Sony PlayStation, they said, actually works better because of the lighting, the natural lighting in the HMD being so bright and, and visible. What Split VR is intended to do is create a massive room scale playing area to the point where, so they've got it working four cameras for each 25 square meter section. So you can see this can scale up very, very nice and up to four person multiplayer but again, and I caution very specifically, it's not a standalone technology. So it's not something that, you know, in the sense that it requires its own HMD, it's more supplemental, an add-on, a, a tool, really, right, that you can use, like a Vorpex. You will be able to program specifically for that tool set. And that's what they've done, these devs. They've actually created two games. They're really kind of mini games. The first, or... One of them is really an experience, and that's the Japanese garden experience. What they're trying to get across in that experience is the scale, right? A full-on Japanese garden, no compromise. All the space that that garden takes up, you get in VR, which is cool. And the next one is a bit of a, uh, of a shooter. So these aren't massive, big production, big budget games. They're more kind of like technology demo slash mini games. But their hope is that this becomes a tool that gets used in VR arcades. People can write games for it and utilize existing hardware that's out on the market. So yeah, check that out. That's Split VR. What really gets me excited about that, guys, is that whole concept of what ultimately I hope something like OSVR, right? That open source nature. I can see 
hobbyists, right? Just hackers, whatever you want to call them, getting together and creating some amazing, wicked experiences, you know, with that kind of a tool set. Um, stuff that we can't imagine or creating that type of a, of a set, a tool set where room scale literally gets turned on its head. And even if the platform you're playing it on doesn't officially support, you know, a given size configuration using this, you can. And I don't know that kind of sounds oddly appealing to go to a warehouse space and just imagine that like a really intense, creepy, full-on VR scaled experience that you could literally walk around in. Which brings us to the last part, and that is right now it's still tethered, but they use backpacks. Their hope is that moving forward, once the wireless technology gets to the point where it can be used, it's going to be that much more seamless, and the foundation will have already been built and put in place to expand on. So that's Split VR. Check it. Um, I've got the link in the description below per normal. All right, guys, as always, cheers and definitely catch you on the VR flip side.